Good evening. You are listening to LPJ. Speaker Radio with Mr. and Mrs. Sweet Thing. And how are you today? Fine, I hope. I am doing fine. And how are you doing? I'm great. And I hope that you all are doing fine too. It's been a wonderful day. God has blessed us. Such a glorious with day. With a glorious day. It's been just beautiful. If you're above ground, it's a good day. Whether yes, you it do or not, is. it's Amen. a good day. God bless again to uh, get together and worship Him, praise His name, and lift Him up. So it's a good day. Yes, it is. And we thank you so much for coming and joining us once again as we, as the title say, come to praise Jesus. Yes, we come to praise Jesus, and we got the scripture to start you out so we can go back to praise Jesus. Yes. And this is in Psalm chapter 19, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, the Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Also, before we go on to our music tonight, we got a public service announcement. Yes. Yes, we do. And this is a Spiritual Traveler's Annual Gospel Roundup. And it will be featuring special guests from St. Louis, Missouri, the Silver Wings. And also Sister Gail McNewen, Mystery of Ceremony. Local guests is the Grisby Family Singers, the the Hughes Family Singers, and other guests. And this is on Sunday. If you haven't got a ticket, you got time. This is on Sunday, May 3rd. At 3 o'clock at the SIUC Student Center Auditorium in Carbondale, Illinois. Tickets for adults is $10 in advance, 15 at the door. Children and students are 5 to $7. So if you need tickets or more information, you can call Dennis James at 618-203-4888 or Clarence Harrington at 618-534-2919. And that's the Civil Wings, I tell you. I, I love those boys. They, oh, they, yeah, they oh, are awesome. So we will awesome. be playing some of them when we, you know, may if not tonight, we'll definitely be getting them in there so you can hear what they sound oh, like. Oh, yeah. So uh, just leave it locked in, and let's get with praising the Lord here on, on LPJ. S- yes. Love, love peace, peace, and, and joy. joy.
worship today. Be pleased, be pleased, be pleased, be pleased, be pleased, be pleased with my worship today. Send your anointing, teach me how to pray. Be pleased, be pleased with my worship today. While I am worshiping, help me seek your face. Be pleased, be pleased with my worship today. Take us from faith to faith, glory to glory. Release your presence from heaven to earth. Be pleased as we worship and give you praise.
And as we travel to one of the greatest, greatest chapters in our convention, right on down south, a group of energetic young people under the direction of Brother Prince Elders. Come on, Gospel Music Workshop of America. Won't you please put your hands together and show some love to one of the greatest chapters in this convention, the Birmingham chapter of the Gospel Music Workshop of America.
Oh, 
I wake up in the morning, I could do one of two things. I could say, well, what a lot of people say, well, you know, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. What you're saying is, you know, I'm not what I ought to be, but thank God I'm going to be saved. No, that's not what it's about. You know what you can say? You can wake up in the morning and say, thank God I'm a saint. I'm indwelt by the Son of God. And everything I need for this day is fully prepared because He is in control of my life. That's what you have the right to say. Many people believe that becoming a Christian means Jesus will fix everything that's wrong in your life. But today on In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley, he explains that Jesus doesn't save you to patch up the holes. He replaces your inheritance of sin with His righteousness and becomes your life. Here's part one of The Key to the Christian Life. Would it shock you if I told you, I just can't live this Christian life? Thank you, sir. Would it shock you if I told you, neither can you? Do I get another amen? Amen. Well, one of the happiest days of my life is when I discovered that I couldn't, he knew I couldn't, and it was okay, he was going to show me what the truth was. Because you see, I, like a lot of other people, had struggled and struggled and struggled, and when I was saved at the age of 12, the pastor said, Charles, you grow up and be a good boy, and one of these days you go to heaven or something like that, or God will bless you. And so I did what he said. I tried to grow up and be a good boy. And uh, sometimes I was, and sometimes I wasn't all that good. And somewhere along the way, uh, I I figured I had a problem. And I think a lot of people have felt that way. They've listened to somebody preach the gospel. They've trusted Christ as their Savior. And they think, I'm going to have a new life, and it's going to be fantastic. And it didn't take them very long to think, I sort of feel like what I used to feel. And things aren't going his way the way I thought they ought to. And so there's sometimes confusion. I'd been a pastor for quite some time. And I still struggle with that. And I would fast and pray and ask God to give me wisdom and direction and show me the truth. And I came to the conclusion there had to be something better, really. Or something that I didn't know. Somewhere I've missed something. I remember there used to be one man who came down the aisle of that particular church at least twice a month. That's no exaggeration. He came down as sincere as he could be, and he would tell me he was rededicating his life. Well, it got to the point that I thought, wait a minute. Either I don't have an answer for this man, or I keep saying, yes, I understand. We pray, and he'd go back up the aisle. Wonderful man, very sincere, but somehow he just couldn't live it, and he couldn't figure out why. And so... That bothered me a little bit, but then I was preaching through the book of Galatians. And I was coming to the fifth chapter, which said the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, goodness, peace, mercy, all those things. And I thought, Lord, I don't have that. I may have it on Sunday, but I don't have it on Monday sometimes. And I think about it all through the week. A lot of times I don't have patience, and I don't always have self-control. And so I was struggling with that. I said, Lord, I'm not going to get up and tell people. It's just the way it is at this point in life. And so what am I going to do? I genuinely struggle with that. One night, walked out to my study in the backyard, and I was praying, and I'd been reading. They found the secret. Simple little book. 20 biographical sketches of people and their spiritual experiences. And I began with the first one, Hudson Taylor. I read a few pages, and I thought, Here's a man who sounds and feels, must feel just like I do. I read that chapter. God opened my eyes to something that in spite of all my college and seminary and preaching and all the rest and conferences, I never saw this. I got on my face before the Lord and God spoke to my heart and revealed to me something so simple, so plain, so easy, absolutely revolutionized my life. And then I realized why I'd failed so many times. And that's what I want to talk about in this message. And that is the key to the Christian life. And I want you to listen carefully. Because it'll go right by you 
if you don't listen carefully. Because I know that many of you feel just like I've felt. Well, this isn't working. There's something wrong with the Christian life. Where, where's God in all this? So I want you to turn, if you will, to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, and I want us to read these first seven verses of this chapter. And Paul begins by saying, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to what? Immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. Now, I want you to look at this particular verse. Verse 4, listen to this. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Now, what in the world does he mean by that? Here is the key to the whole Christian life. And I think for us to understand it fully and simply, let's begin with the first thing that's necessary for us to understand, and that is this life before our salvation. You are living the life that you were living, whatever that might be. And finally, somewhere along the way, you heard the truth of the gospel. And when you did, several things happened. Number one, you got into conviction. That is, the Spirit of God convicted you of your sin. And there was a sense of regret, a sense of shame, a sense of guilt, and maybe a little bit of fear that you've been living your life outside the will of God and not recognizing what God had been trying to say to you. And so what did you do? You made a decision at that point. When you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, that's the beginning of a relationship. Until that happens, there is a separation between you and God. And listen carefully. A person doesn't change that relationship by getting better and better and better and better and better until finally I'm pretty good. In your eyes, maybe, but in God's eyes, total separation. Because what we forget is this, God is holy. And because God is holy, he cannot accept sinfulness. He deals with it. And so every person without Christ is separated from God. I know that runs against the grain of some of you, but it is the gospel truth. So what you have to ask is this, is the Bible true? If it is, you're separated from God. If it is not true, it wouldn't make any difference what you believe anyway. But God says you're separated from him and you need a relationship. With that in mind, we have to ask the question, and that's simply this. Once I realize that I am in that condition, now what? Well, I need to understand what transpires when a person is saved. Here's what transpires. First of all, you're convicted of that sin. The Holy Spirit convicts you. That is, it isn't that you just start feeling bad. The Spirit of God convicts you of that sin. And then there's what? There's shame. There's regret. There's guilt and all the hurt that goes on inside of you. You absolutely recognize your sinfulness and that you are separated from God. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He makes you aware of that. And the moment I accept my sinfulness as having separated me from God and that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came into this world and died on the cross and shed his blood and the shedding of his blood paid for my sins. The moment I'm willing to accept him as my sin bearer, as the atoning sacrifice for my sins, and say, I do receive Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, in that moment, my sins are wiped away, they're forgiven, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Sins are forgiven, our name is written in the Lamb's book of life. The Holy Spirit seals us as he comes into our life. He comes into our life to seal us forever as a child of God and to live and work through us. And everything in our life has a reason to change. Because once I was dead, you read it, now I'm alive in Christ Jesus. Once I was alone in it, now I have the Holy Spirit coming to live within me and to seal me, the Bible says, under the day of redemption till he calls me home. And so what transpires here is this awesome change. Does not the Bible say that we are born again? That means I got a new life. Something's happened to me. 
And as many as believe in him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. I got a new relationship. Therefore, he says, in Christ Jesus, old things have passed away. All things have become new. So what do I have? I have a brand new life. I have a brand new attitude. And so my life has changed. I was dead in trespasses and sins. Now I'm alive through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross. So that's what's happened. Here's where I was. Now I've been saved. Now what? Well, all that's wonderful when I think about it and think about that heaven is our home. And I can remember as a kid growing up and having been saved and thinking that when I die now I'm going to heaven. And, uh, but, but I discovered, I didn't discover it all right then, but I discovered two things that all of us have to deal with. Watch this carefully. It's one thing to know that you have a relationship to Christ, that you're going to heaven when you die. But after you're saved, we have two big problems. One of them is this. We have to live in a world where there is rebellion, disobedience, all kinds of corruption, evil, wickedness, Satan loose, and all kinds of things we have to deal with all around us. We have to live among people who don't like what we believe and who live for the devil, and, who, and it's all about them. That's one thing. And we can't change that. That'll always be till Jesus comes. But the second thing I have to deal with, even though I'm saved, my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, is this. I still have within me, like every believer does, because we're still living in these fleshly bodies and we're on earth, we still have that fleshliness in us. That's what Paul called it, living in the flesh, which is that propensity or that, listen, that desire that crops up in us once in a while, and all of a sudden, we want to do something that we know is not the will of God. So, I have two things I have to deal with as a believer. I've got this world I've got to live in, and secondly, I have this something within me, as long as I live in this life. Some people call it the old nature. You can call it anything you want to. One thing for certain, we all have it. Amen? We all have it. It's a little light, but I know it's in you. Uh, we, we, we all have it, and we have to deal with it, because that's where the problem comes. If I don't understand what God really arranged for me, then I'm going to struggle with it and struggle with it and struggle with it. Now, I'm not saying that you ever reach a stage in your life where you live perfect from there on. No more sin. It would be absolutely wonderful if it were. Only when we get to heaven. We live in this sinful world and we have within us, and as long as we're living in the flesh and our eyes and our ears, we can hear this and see that and feel and touch the other, then we have to deal with it. So how did Jesus desire to deal with that? What did he do? How do we deal with it? Because once you're saved with the grace of God, that's a settled issue as far as your salvation is concerned. But how do I deal with this? So I want you to go back to uh, Colossians chapter 3 for a moment. And notice what Paul said in verse 4. When Christ, who is our life? What is the key to living the Christian life? When you trust that Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, He came into your life to dwell and to live in you and through you the life that he's provided and planned for each and every one of us. You remember what Jesus said to his disciples that night before he was going to be crucified the next day? He said, now I'm going away. But he said, I, I don't want you to feel like orphans because I'm going to come back to you. He said, my, my father's going to send you the Holy Spirit, one just like me. And uh, when he comes, uh, here's what he'll do. And he gives us those things. So, what happens? When you and I trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, He came into our life to seal us as a child of God. And now, we have within us the life of Christ. When Christ, who is your life, shall appear. And if you'll look in Galatians chapter 2 for a moment, and if you'll notice what uh, Paul says here, and there are many verses, but I just want you to get a few of these down in your thinking. In the second chapter and the 20th verse, listen to what Paul says. And a lot of folks, I'm, I'm reminded when I talked to a young man, I was talking to him about a particular passage of Scripture, and he and I were in disagreement. And I said, well, here's what God says. What are you going to do about that? He says, I'm just not going to read that verse. <laughs> well, this is the way some people come to this verse. They say, I don't understand it, so I'm not going to read it. It's a, it's a very important verse. In uh, Galatians chapter 2, 20, listen. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. And he uses a perfect tense, which means this. Something happened to me in the past, and the effect of that is continuing even now. 
I have been crucified with Christ. And he says, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Listen, Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now look at this. What does he mean by being crucified? Here's what he means. When you and I trust that Jesus Christ is our personal Savior, the Bible says, listen, born again. So what happens? We died to our old life. Now we have the Spirit of Jesus. We have Christ living on the inside of us. Some of us say, oh, no, wait a minute. But isn't he seated at the Father's right hand? He is. Seated at the Father's right hand, doing his work, his authority all over the world. At the same time, remember what he said. He says, I'm going to send the Spirit. And he says, he'll be in you, with you, and upon you. And he says, I'm coming to you. When the Holy Spirit indwelt your life at salvation, the Holy Spirit, listen, a person of the Trinity, his primary responsibility is to live out through us the very life of Jesus. And so when Paul says, when you have Christ, you have everything. You, you have Jesus. He is our life. What did you have before? You had death. What do you have now as a believer? You have life. You have eternal life. The Son of God living within you. And you can just go verse after verse where Paul mentions those kind of things. And for example, here's another verse that's interesting. In uh, Philippians, look in chapter 1 and the 21st verse. And Paul says it a little different way here because the phrase in Christ is the Apostle Paul's choice phrase that sums up his theology. Being in Christ and Christ in us. Now listen to this carefully. You're listening, say amen. amen. In Christ makes me fit for heaven. Christ in me makes me fit for this life. And you've got to have both. I in Christ, our being in Christ makes us fit for heaven. Christ in me enables me to live a godly life in this life here and now. So look what he says in Philippians chapter 1. Just one verse, I'll read a short one. Verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. What is he saying? He's saying, because Christ lives within him, for him to live is for Christ to live. That is, Christ is walking and living around in every single one of us. We have Christ living within us. And so often we think of God's up yonder, Jesus up yonder, the Holy Spirit, whoever he is, is down here and I'm doing the best I can. It doesn't work that way. The Christian life, listen, he intends for us to live this life joyfully, confidently, and fruitfully. Does that mean I'm not going to have any problems? Certainly doesn't mean that. But notice what I said, joyfully, confidently, and fruitfully. When difficult times come, I'm confident. But it's Christ's life within you. And until a person is able to understand that, what did he say? He says, Christ who is our life, once dead, now alive. What makes us alive? The presence of Jesus Christ within us. And so when Paul says, for to me to live is Christ, what he's simply saying is this, that because Christ is living within us, when you and I are alive, Christ is living in and through you. What makes you and me different from the unbelieving world is that we have Christ within us because is it not true that sometimes we act like them? Christians sometimes act like the world. But what makes us different is not how we act, though we should live a godly life, and we can. What makes us different is we possess the Lord Jesus Christ. Now watch this. Paul says, Jesus is in God, and God is in Jesus. And we are in Jesus, and Jesus is in God, that makes us in God. And God who is in Jesus and Jesus who is in us and God who is in Jesus, you know what, it's this one awesome relationship. And when a person will think about that and think about it soberly, you, listen, you have God, the Son Jesus living within you. You say, well now, aren't they two different persons? Two different persons. But what Jesus said, you remember what he said? He says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. So that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but He's also deity. Now remember this, what makes the difference between us and the rest of the world is that Jesus, God, in the person of His Son through the Holy Spirit, is living His life in us. That's what makes us different. 
Domestic violence is everyone's problem. I'm working with the National Network to End Domestic Violence to end the silence on domestic violence. Please text HOPE to 41010 to make a one-time $10 donation to the National Network and their partners across the country. By texting today, Hope Line by Verizon will match your gift, doubling your $10. Please help us end the silence on domestic violence. Please step up. Thank you. Messaging and data rates may apply.
can give flowers as beautiful as the month of May. And you can give your diamonds as bright as day, as bright as day. As lovely as the lovely as the spring and fall, but remember love is love is the greatest gift. The feel of love is beyond compare. Now don't you feel good? Don't you feel good? To know that love is there. As a matter of fact, you can give millions that will make others happy too. Listen, you can even give beautiful things. This message is for all of you that have received the word from God, and you're waiting for it to come to pass. You've been waiting and believing, but yet you still haven't seen what you're waiting for. We just want to remind you that God is never slack concerning His promise. So you can start to talk about your promises if it's already been fulfilled. By faith you can say everything is changed. Proclaim. I proclaim his word. His word. I'm standing, standing on his word. On his word. He promised me a change. He promised me a change. And I receive it. And I receive it. He said, No lack is in my life. Full healings in my life. Full healings in my life. Everything is restored. Everything is restored. Everything I lost is now restored. Everything is restored. All of my past is gone. All of my past is gone. All 
the hurt and all the pain is gone. All hurt and pain is gone. And everything has changed. Everything is changed. For me. I believe it today. Come on, say that again. I believe. Lift your voice and say. I believe. His word. And I receive. I receive. His word. His word. Oh, oh. He promised me a change. He gave me a promise. And because he's God. And I. I believe. I believe. I proclaim. Oh, I proclaim. I will. His word. I will. I will. I'm standing on His word. Standing on His word. Standing on His word. He promised to me a change. He promised me a change. And by faith I receive it. I got a word from God. He said, "No lack is in my life." No lack Come on, say. Is in my life. No lack is in he promised he would hear my body. No in my life. Everything I lost is now restored. Everything's restored. Everything is restored. Everything's restored. All of my past is in the past. And say everything is changed. Everything is changed for me. For me. Oh yeah, oh yeah. One more time, lift your hands no and let's say it together. Lack is in Come on. My life. No lack is in my life. Yes, I believe in you.
one of you out there who've been experiencing some difficult times in life. Let this song encourage you. I hear the word of the Lord saying that everything is going to be all right. God has a way of taking what the devil meant for evil and turning it around for good. What the devil meant to destroy you and to mess your life up, God will use that very thing to bring victory and triumph in your life. So no matter what's going on, no matter what tears you have to shed, no matter what burdens you have to bear, understand that God specializes in things that are impossible and he has everything under control. So I encourage you on tonight to lift your voice toward God and lift your hands to him and let him work it out. Come on, Adam, tell him I'm going to and never die No, no, no Lay it rain Specializes In things impossible Did you know that gout is a type of arthritis? In fact, it's the most common type of inflammatory arthritis worldwide, affecting roughly 3-4% to of the population. Gout affects men much more commonly than it does women, with the first symptoms usually appearing between the ages of 35 and 50. Gout is caused by too much uric acid in the body. When these uric acid levels get high enough, the uric acid actually forms crystals. Now the body's immune system attacks these crystals causing pain, swelling, redness, and warmth of the affected joint. To help you further understand this, we're going to introduce you to our gout sink. Imagine we have a sink, and this sink is full of the uric acid stored in your body. Every day, in your body, your muscles and tissues are rejuvenating. The purines in the DNA from the old muscle and tissue cells are broken down ultimately to uric acid. So uric acid is produced every day by your body. Every day, we eat uric acid as part of our diet. 
Animal meat is the most common source of uric acid, and any meat, even chicken or fish, will contribute to the uric acid load. Alcohol, especially beer and sugary drinks like soda, also increase the uric acid in your body. Uric acid is lost from the body through your kidneys, and it ends up in your urine. Now, if all things are in balance, you make as much uric acid as you get rid of, and the levels in our sink stay constant. But over time, our kidneys aren't as efficient at getting rid of uric acid. Now, this is a normal part of aging, and uric acid levels increase as we age. But uric acid levels can accumulate more rapidly in those who have more serious kidney problems and those who are prescribed water pills, also known as diuretics. Finally, there are some people whose kidneys work perfectly fine, but they just don't get rid of uric acid efficiently. This is a genetic problem and tends to run in families, and their uric acid levels rise faster than normal. As we get older, we also tend to eat foods richer in uric acid, and our bodies are also breaking down at higher rates. The result of this imbalance is a rise in the uric acid levels in our body. The first problem with gout comes when our sink overflows and causes a puddle of water on the floor. This puddle of water is like having an acute attack of gout. So with gout you can see we have two problems. The first problem is the water on the floor and the second problem is our overflowing sink. When we treat gout, we have to do two things. Number one, mop the water, which is like treating the acute attack of gout. And number two, turn off the taps to stop the sink from overflowing, which is like lowering the uric acid levels. Let's focus on our first task, mopping up the water. The first thing to understand is what causes the sink to overflow or what triggers an acute attack of gout. These triggers include starting or stopping urate lowering therapy, like febuxostat or allopurinol, dehydration, trauma, for example, you stub your toe, a recent illness or surgery, and finally, excessive alcohol intake. So just how do we treat an acute attack of gout or mop the water off the floor? Well, we use medications like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, also known as NSAIDs. A common NSAID used to treat gout is indomethacin. We can also directly inject joints with steroids, which is quite effective. We can give tablets of prednisone, and finally, we can give a medicine called colchicine. Now, once we've got the water on the floor all mopped up, we can now turn our attention to the sink. Our second task is to turn the taps off on our sink to prevent it from overflowing. We can start by changing our diet by reducing or eliminating alcohol eating less animal protein, such as red meat, chicken, fish, and other seafood, and by reducing our intake of sugary drinks like sodas and fruit juices. But sometimes simply altering our diet isn't good enough. We often need to use specific medications to lower the uric acid. These medications actually prevent our bodies from forming uric acid. There are two of them, named allopurinol and febuxostat, which is also known as euloric. Both of these medicines are very effective for lowering uric acid. It's important to remember that you'll need to keep taking these medications to keep your uric acid levels low. Our target for ur our uric acid levels is less than 360 micromoles per liter, which is equivalent to 6 milligrams per deciliter. Why this level? Well, this is the saturation limit for uric acid, and crystals won't form at these levels. Reducing our uric acid levels will prevent future attacks of gout. High uric acid levels have also been associated with heart attacks and strokes, which gives us another good reason to eat healthier, exercise, and lower our uric acid levels. Now, one of the things that can happen in gout is we get the uric acid levels to target, but the attacks of gout continue. Here's an explanation. Our body is made up of tissue and blood vessels. The blood vessels run through the tissue and supply it with oxygen and nutrients. When we measure the uric acid levels, we're measuring the levels in the blood. But the tissue levels can remain high for some time and take longer to fall than those in the blood. Now, Over time, as the tissue levels of uric acid fall, so will your attacks of gout. Unfortunately, this can take 6 to 12 months. There are a few gout rules that we have to follow 
to make sure you get the best possible treatment and result. Number one, mop up the water or treat the acute attack of gout before you start to mess with the taps or lower the uric acid level. Number two, once the water is mopped up, then start the urate lowering therapy, allopurinol or febuxostat. Number three, you may need to keep the mop out as gout can flare when you start or stop urate lowering therapy. Number four, do not stop urate lowering therapy during an acute attack of gout. Simply treat the attack of gout, mop up the water, but keep the taps turned off. Number five, measure uric acid levels monthly to make sure you're hitting the target. We'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. For more information, please visit our website, www.roominfo.com. All right, everybody, put your hands together. Let's reverence the Lord in this place. For he's the reward of those that diligently seek him. I remember the time when I felt like giving up, and he said, don't give up. I have something in store for you. And this is what I'm going to say. Something. Something Wait in the store. It's something good. You will see. When I go through the storm, know that it shall be in vain. Because God has something in store for me. No matter what comes my way, I come to let you know. Now if you don't mind, I'd like to say that one more time. Something is waiting. It's store for me. It's something good. You'll see. See, when I go through the storm in the rain, I just want you to know that it shall not be God has something for me.
you at? Come on, say hold up. Somebody say over, over. and over. And over again. Lord, you done so much. Lord, you done so much. All to you I owe. All to you I owe. I will ever. I will ever sing your praise. Uh huh. Glory to your name. Don't make no way. Don't make no way for me. Let's say it one more time. Keep on making a way. Somebody say over, over, and over, over again. Yeah, all the way. Somebody say over, over, and over, over again. Don't you do it so much? Don't you do it so much? Hey. All to you I owe. All to you I owe. I will ever. Keep on making a way right here on LPJ. You Speaker have been listening Radio. to. That's yeah, right. Yes, I tell you. Keep on making a way. We he have always had. make a way. God makes a way all the time. Yes, he does. He's making a way when you sleep. You got that. Yeah, right. he's always there. He don't get tired. No, he don't. He don't wear down like we wear down. He just make a way each and every day. That's right. Yeah. I tell you. It's That's been why a, we come to praise Jesus. That's right. We come to praise him. I've had a great night. hope that you had a great night. Always when we come together to praise God and lift his name up, we, we have a great time. I don't yes, know about do. you, but mm-hmm. I do. And uh, the night has come to an end again. Someone has to go to work in the morning. Well, thank you, Lord, for the job. Yes, but we had a great time. We'll be back tomorrow night for a show. We'll be back tomorrow night to meet up with you again, to praise the Lord, lift him up, and just praise his name. 
and we hope that you have had a good time as you stopped in tonight and joined us as always we did that's right and we got another scripture coming your way and this is in second corinthians chapter 9 verse 8 and god is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times having all that you need you will abound in every good work Every good work. Amen. 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 I tell you. Only through Jesus you can abound in every good work. Only through Jesus. Only through Jesus mm-hmm. we can do anything. That's right. We can't do anything without him. But all things. But all things through, through Jesus is possible. is possible. Amen to that. And I tell you, it's, it's been wonderful being with you tonight. But as always, we have to always go out right. We have to always talk to our Heavenly Father before we go. And we just thank Him for this day, this evening, that we got together as a whole, that we all love Him. We know that we wouldn't be here. But our Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. We come before your throne, Lord, asking you to forgive us, first of all, for our sins, our hidden sins, Father. Anything that we may have said or done or any way that we may have acted, Lord, that you were displeased with, Lord. We know that we do things that are displeasing to you. We come before you, Lord, to ask you to forgive us for those things, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to make us strong where we're weak. Lord, give us strength to overcome the things that we're weak in. Lord, give us strength to overcome the weakness and make us strong where we're weak, Lord, that we can become stronger servants for you, Lord, that we may be more like you, that we may be forgiven like you, Lord, that we can love in the way that you love, that we can love our enemy most of all, Lord. That is the hardest thing for all of us to do is love someone that do not love us or love someone that have misused us or talked about us. Lord, give us the love in our heart to love those people. The ones that don't love us, Lord, that's the one that we have trouble loving and the ones that misuse us and talk about us behind our back and in our face. Lord, give us a heart to love them, Lord. The ones that we can't love, give us a heart to love them, Lord. Be with us, Lord, throughout the night. Lord, watch over us as we sleep. Lord, give us a heart to forgive those that won't forgive us. Give us a heart to forgive those that have misused us. You should love our enemies, Lord. Give us a heart to forgive them as well as to love them. Lord, we know that we're not what we used to be. And thank you, Lord, that we're not. Lord, wash us and clean us up. We need washing and cleaning every day. And we ask you, Lord, to Wash and dig as deep as you have to to get us prepared to go home one day when you come back. We know, Lord, that we need to be washed and cleansed. We know that we got a lot more work that you need to do in us to prepare us for heaven. And, Lord, we just ask you to do it. We know that we're not all that we should be. But thank you, Lord, that we're not what we used to be. And, Lord, we just ask you that we know that it all starts with us. That's why tonight, Lord, we're asking you to work on us. Do in us. Clean us. Because the problem starts with us, Lord. We know that it's us that needs to be worked on. That once you cleanse us and get us right, then it all falls in place, Jesus. Now, we know that self is our biggest problem. So, Lord, work on self that we may be more like you, that the world will see uh, you in us once you cleanse us and wash us. The world will see love in us once you cleanse us. Love will see happiness and joy in, in us once you work on us. The world will see you once you cleanse us, Lord. So tonight, Lord, we're just asking you to work on us Cleanse us, wash us, so we can be that light in a dark world, so we can shine for you, Lord. Tonight is a night that I'm asking you to work on us, 
to clean us, Lord, because we're the problem ourselves, self-pride, our high self-esteem of ourselves, Lord. We ask you to work on us so we can be a light, so we can finish the work that you have asked us to do, Lord. I'm asking you, Lord, tonight to clean house in here so I can be and be the servant that you have asked me to be, so I can be the light, so I can be a light that will send people to you, Amen. so you can heal more people, so people will, will, will understand that you love them as you have loved me. Father, I ask you to cleanse me tonight. I'm asking you to work on me so the world can see you in me. And that's what needs to be done, Lord. We talk about Jesus and we talk about God and people can see you or your Father in me. Amen. So, Lord, work on me. This is my prayer tonight is for you to work on me so the light can shine bright so people can find their way to you through me because of the light. Your light is not shining in us, Lord, because we need to be worked on. We need to be cleansed so the light can shine. So, Lord, my prayer tonight is to let your love and your Holy Spirit fall and cleanse me so I can be right and I can walk the walk as well as I talk the talk. Heavenly Father, I just ask to let your will be done here on earth as it is in your kingdom tonight. Amen. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we truly thank you for your goodness, your wonderful grace and mercy that have kept us each and every day. And Lord, we thank you for your blessings and your protection around us as we went to and from today. And Lord, tonight we truly come in agreement with my husband as truly we do need to be cleansed. And we ask you tonight to forgive us and become selfishness and prideful and backbiting and lies and gossip idle spoken words, all the things, Lord, we know that's unpleasing in your sight. We ask to be cleansed from that tonight. And tonight, Lord, we come to surrender it all to you tonight. We ask you, Lord, to again cleanse us, to renew our mind and renew that steadfast spirit within us. And again, Lord, we ask you to fill us with your wonderful Holy Spirit that leads us and guides us each and every day. And Lord, once again, we ask you to use us as vessels each and every day that we may live that life of Christ that people may see Jesus through our lives each and every day again we don't just want to speak your word we want to live it as well as we always give you the praise honor and the glory as we continue Lord in being witnesses for you we pray Lord that you give us strength thanking you for your word which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path each and every day as we continue to lift each other up, Lord, and, and encourage each other in the love like you love, that unconditional love as you have asked us to do for our enemies, for our brothers and sisters in Christ, you have asked us to do that. And only through you, Lord, we can love like that. Again, we give you all the praise and the honor and the glory, and we thank you for your peace, your joy, your strength, your love, and your protection as we continue to pray, Lord, as you strengthen our marriage as we become one and healing and everything else, Lord, in you. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. And may the Lord bless you. Have a great night. Take care until we see you tomorrow night. And have a great night. And may the windows of heaven open and pour upon you a bundle of blessings. And have a good night. <laughs>
I stand in His.